Scott, thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Brother, thank you for having me on. Great to be on. No problem at all. Like, I'm really excited about this. I know we've, we've had this lined up for a few months and kind of one or two things got in the way. Um, so yeah, really excited about getting into this, this topic, which is becoming more and more kind of important within the field of strength, uh, strength conditioning as the, the weeks, months, and even years go by. So I know people are going to get, take a lot from this, but just before we get into the details, why don't you give people a quick introduction about who you are uh, and kind of what you've been doing? Absolutely. So a uh, Chicago area kid went to school in the suburbs, went to school downstate at Illinois State University. And that was kind of my moment of reckoning where I, I realized there was a dichotomy between the way that we should be prepared for sport and the way that we were actually being prepared for sport. Uh, sent me down some rabbit holes that landed me uh, working for Eric Coram at the University of Kentucky when he was running the high performance program there. And that was really kind of the, the catalyst or formative experience for what's always been my, my North Star as a coach. And so that led me to taking a graduate assistant position in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the University of Tulsa, which is timely given the, the massive brawl they were on TV for the other day. Um, from there, that led to an opportunity to uh, come back full circle and work for Eric in a full-time capacity at the College of William & Mary in Virginia. And that was where we we tried at the, the high performance project across the entirety of the athletic department um, and failed ultimately. But the growth I went through there and the amount of learning that I was able to do being around guys like Eric and Kier constantly uh, was massive for my development as a coach. And ultimately they were basically pushing me out the door uh, when the opportunity to go to the University of Arizona presented itself. And the funny piece of that that whole um, step professionally was that it, it started from an Instagram DM that I had posted something about GPS on Instagram and Brian Johnson, the, uh, the guy who was the head strength coach at University of Arizona football, uh, he hit me up and said they were looking for somebody that um, had some capabilities with GPS. And so that was the, the catalyst, for the conversation that led to me going there. And so that's where I've been ever since in the warm weather, um, enjoying the change of scenery from a uh, much sleeper Williams, Virginia to a much more lively town in the desert. So that's where I'm at now. I'm actually in Chicago now, back home with family. Uh, so it's a little bit colder than normal, but yeah, that's where I'm at. No doubt. And you've got you've to be enjoying the, the sun of, uh, of Arizona. That's a lovely place to be and uh, quite the change in scenery from, from Williamsburg, Virginia. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, Oh, dude, 24 hours before my, my flight home, I was taking a nap at the pool and it was 70 degrees. It was <laughs> blissful. <laughs> That's what you need. That's what you need. So uh, just I'm going to pick up on something that you talked about there. So obviously during your time at, at William & Mary, um, Eric Coram and yourself uh, and, and Kier and the other kind of staff members there, um, you talked about the, the high performance project that you were, you were pulling together. Do you mind just, just touching kind of on what that looked like and kind of what that entailed because I think that's actually a really good place to start for what uh, like some of the things I want to get into today yeah so what made it very alluring to go there was um, you know one, one of the limitations I saw with my time with him at Kentucky was that fundamentally change is going to occur from the top down and so um, if you're not able to have a seat at the big table, make the big decisions that of the direction uh, which an athletic program is going to go, you're not going to be able to ultimately create the changes that you want to make for that sort of model to become effective. Or, you know, it's ultimately going to, to reach a bottleneck where you can only change at the rate of the people that are um, slowest changing within the organization. Uh, but so what made it super enticing was Eric was going to be a, a senior uh, level athletic director. So he was going to sit at the big table to be able to create policy, um, advocate for our departments, including sports med, nutrition and psychology, uh, and was going to be able to obviously objectively evaluate the way that we were able to do our job. So all of the, these pieces that, you know, get readily talked about when we look at how do we create uh, better better careers for people within strength and conditioning, all these pieces were going to be in place. And then, you know, midway through kind of the, the courting process, if you will, that Eric and I went through when he was telling me about the job to when I actually interviewed and got on the ground, uh, he tells me Kier is going to come in. And it was a little fanboy moment of like, this guy's a dude in strength and conditioning and I get to work with him. And so we set to work on um, 
you know, initially in that first year, I thought it was we, what we did really well was we said we are going to keep it to a couple of sports that we're going to focus on and just get very small, um, you know, very small pockets of success with these sports and then use that to roll it out on a much fuller capacity to the remainder in the athletic department. Because it's a very, there's a lot of sports that they answer at William & Mary. Uh, I believe it's 23 right now. And we didn't quite have the staff resources in place yet to be able to take on all the sports and give them the level of uh, care required for a, an effective high performance model to be taken under. Um, so the plan was that we would eventually expand to a point where we had more staff, more people in place that are fundamentally aligned to those principles that would allow us to take this project out to the entirety of the athletic department. So I was very lucky in that I was given charge of one of the sports that would be taken on this high performance project. One of the pieces that made that work so well was that the, the coaches were very heavily bought into it from start. Part of that was inherent to the fact that they were kind of on their, their last legs as coaches at the school. And so it was a, like, if you take this under, we'll give you another year as a coach. But then they also, from a mentality standpoint, had the right growth mindset towards it and towards trying to better understand it and work harmoniously with me as I figured out how to do my job in, in this landscape. And so, you know, when I came in, Eric had already been onboarding them and educating them around all these pieces of you know, basic tactical periodization, answering the question, what is stress? Teaching them how to teach skills and how to put it all together with a uh, high low periodization model that I would help kind of uh, curate with all the pieces that were, were moving across the chessboard. And so you know, very, very organically, we, we bonded as a staff beyond just the, the job we were working at together. We all, um, it was one of the, the sum of the, the parts is greater than make sure I say that right. Some of the parts is greater than the, uh, I'm going to mess it up in the hole. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know your hole yes. is great. Hole is greater than the sum of its parts. There it is. There it is. Um, but it, it was, it was one of those things that just, it really organically came together and we saw massive improvements. Um, most fundamentally in, in terms of winning, uh, we saw huge improvements in player availability. And then uh, also physical qualities that obviously, you know, we as performance coaches are, are directly responsible for moving the needle on. We saw these just widespread changes. And then, you know, subjectively, the girls absolutely loved uh, what that year was for them. And they, they loved all parts of the program. A lot of them said it was their favorite year that they've been playing lacrosse. And so I, I think as scientific and analytical and, um, quantitative as the high performance model can get painted. Uh, I think there's something emergent to what ultimately manifests when it, it's truly well done. And when all stakeholders are aligned towards doing it well and, and putting their ego aside to make sure that at the end of the day, what happens and, you know, the decisions that are made are all passed that lens of what's the boat go faster. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's something to be said, um, for what ends up being the experience of the athletes when they know that there's fundamental alignment and that everything that's being done is done with the hope to push them in the direction of being better at their sport. And so we, we tried like hell in that first year and we, we did very well. I think it bore a lot of good fruit for us to be able to say, let's roll this out even further. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get more people on the ground. We added one position, but again, for, you know, five people for 20 sports is still a, a pretty rough ratio from a, a coach to athlete perspective. And, and so I think that's ultimately what, what hindered our ability to do the job well when we tried to roll it out across all sports. And then as has been spoken to uh, in another podcast and in other uh, segments, um, we kind of reached a, a tipping point where, you know, due to, the pandemic or what have you, uh, I think a lot of decisions were in the interest of self-preservation that effectively ended up axing the high performance project because of differing viewpoints on the efficacy of it and what people believed, uh, you know, to be the best way to go about it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's unfortunate to me that even with those results that we were able to get with one team that everybody was bought into doing it that way um that there was still um back but again I, I think you, 
go back to the way humans are wired. People are, are wired to react with emotion and people who can, you know, work path to, to be receptive to, to logic and think more with their, their forebrain about, you know, well, this makes sense or this doesn't. Um, those are the kind of people that you need to have within a sporting organization to be able to think in the entirety of the system and recognize the complexity of sport for what it is, that it's not just continuation of, of time-tested traditions and is that you, you prepare athletes to, to play the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, it, ultimately, uh, people reverted to type and kind of regressed back to that main of what they've always known. And so that, uh, you know, obviously gave me the chance to, to move on and, um, you know, move forward in my career. Yeah, and I think there's some, there's some key things that I picked up on there that you, that you said. And I think the big thing that stuck out to me was that subjective kind of athletes felt that that was the most fun they'd had kind of playing lacrosse at, at William & Mary. Like, that's huge because that's, that's what it's about at the end of the day. They've got to enjoy what they do. If they're going to get better and develop skills, first and foremost, they've got, there's got to be an element of enjoyment so they can actually uh, improve their motor patterns. Um, but as well as that, there was a lot of kind of neat data science that you guys got into there. And I know you were kind of uh, speaking to you off air. We were kind of, you thought we were talking about data science on a budget because everyone's got, especially mm-hmm. now with COVID, everyone's kind of budgets being squeezed and squeezed so what does kind of data science look like on a shoestring budget like what can we do that and this could be huge for a lot of small school teams or like I say everyone who's being squeezed at the moment yeah I think a a bit it became what was born out of the the necessity that we had at William and Mary you know I was very fortunate to have a GPS system with my lacrosse team but we also, by that same token, because our, our budget was squeezed otherwise, um, we weren't going to be able to get some sort of athlete monitoring system that we could run uh, wellness data, trend data, and you know consolidate everything to the same platform and have a good uh, all-encompassing uh, picture of what it is the athletes are, are doing, how they're responding to uh, the day-to-day training that they're doing. So that was where a lot of the work that I've done to this point with Google Sheets came about was um, Eric wanting information on the basketball players he was working with and me having done everything in Excel, obviously there's a, there's a limitation to that being offline and me having to go run numbers for him, text them to him and so on and so forth. And so that's where it became, you know, well, Google Sheets has cloud capability. You can have a bunch of people on and so that became kind of the, the centralizing point for us as a department was the, the dashboards that I've done a couple of webinars on Strength Coach Network for. And what that, you know, we looked at it as we're trying to fundamentally answer two questions and help anchor everybody within the department on the two questions. How much, you know, what was the workload they were, were subjected to? And, and was the the cost or what was the the athlete's response to that workload? And that was where all we focused on was the wellness data and the RP or the acute chronic ratio. Mm-hmm. And obviously the acute chronic ratio has been uh, invalidated to this point, but I still think heuristically it's valuable for getting people who may not have a sense of sports science like uh, sport coaches to understand the idea that doing too much too soon is a bad thing. And that there's times of the year where you should overreach and push beyond what the athletes have been uh, acclimatized to from the training standpoint. But then there's also times where you need to back that up. And then also to spurn conversations around, you know, you may have a practice you've done in week one, and then you come back and you do that same practice in week four and the RPEs are lower. And it's, yeah, the external practice that you had them do was the same, but because they, they've trained and they've built up to being able to handle higher, uh, you know, have a higher tolerance for, for the workload you're imposing to them, those practices are no longer equivalent. They feel it's a lot easier. And so I think when you're, you're able to see what to a, a sport coach might look like an anomaly like that, um, it really helps to open up the discussion and kind of invoke some of the more complex pieces of sport preparation. And so, you know, I was able to do that with lacrosse in my second year because our our biggest week of uh, practice was week one and then you come in and you look at weeks where we had two games in the same week 
And the, the total weekly workload of those weeks was significantly lower than that first week. And so then that opened the door to the conversation of, well, yeah, they had just had six weeks off from playing lacrosse and not able to readily go home and just play pick up lacrosse like basketball players can go to a gym and do. Um, so it's just it illustrates the gap between general physical preparation and sport preparation and how, you know, even though we can do a lot of running, there is still something to be said for the, the technical, tactical, psychological complexity of sport. And you're, you're getting a, a visual representation of what the limits are of what we can do on the physical side to where they ultimately need to get most of their conditioning done, which is within the sport itself. So, um, you know, to bring that all back to um, your original question, I think as simple as it is to just begin with tracking RPE data and wellness data, uh, there's a lot of conversations that it can bring up and can ultimately begin to steer the boat in the direction of better performance in sport. And so, you know, as simple as it is, Google Sheets is a, is a free platform. And, uh, you know, we really, we were limited most working with football because of the amount of data that it takes when you're collecting RPEs every day, taking in uh, wellness data every single day from a hundred guys. But for most sports that, you know, your, your middle sized teams are going to be 30 people, 40 people. Um, and then you're going to have smaller teams that are, you know, 10 to 15 people. For those size of teams, you can get through a full semester of data without things ever beginning to slow down. And uh, I'll, I'll plug myself to say that the, the webinars I put together on Strength Coach Network, when you, you get used to that system, it's about a minute or two a day to have real-time information on what the workloads look like for your athletes and how they're tolerating those workloads. And to get, you know, qualitative feedback from the wellness survey, like the, the story I tell often is one of my lacrosse girls uh, dropped a note that her, she found out her grandpa died one morning and she said she was fine, but it was a good, easy piece to pass on to the rest of the coaches so that somebody doesn't accidentally come down way too hard on her because they have a fuller picture of, you know, why she may have messed up or why she may not seem in practice that day. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's an invaluable tool and it's completely free for people to use. And then you be can begin to get into tracking and, and storing data longitudinally so that you can look at one off season compared to another and begin to infer about the, the changes you're making over the course of your, your time within a, an organization. Yeah, and I think, so let's actually, let's get into that. So I think you've laid out a pretty good like, description of what we should do if we've, if we've got this shoestring budget. In other words, get on Google Sheets, um, kind of get that system going. Scott did a great job on his presentation on the Strength Coach Network. Like you said, I think it's a, it's a two-part series. Is that right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, so if you haven't already, like, go and sign up to that. Kia needs to drop some money on this because we're just plugging him here. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, like, that's a phenomenal uh, presentation or two that pretty much explains exactly how to do it. So once that's kind of in place, so you guys got this in place at William & Mary, then you talked a little bit there about how you actually use that data to inform program design. Do you mind going into a little bit more kind of, depth about what that actually looks like so you said obviously once we've got this uh, the data in terms of well you said that one of your athletes grand grandpa grand, uh, grandma died and then we're going to take that information and just give it to a coach just so they know kind of what's going on so we pull back maybe a little bit on that individual athlete and i know there's a lot of other situations where that can be used as well you touched on off season versus in season and off season one year versus off season the next year do you mind I know this is kind of a long-winded way about it, but do you mind kind of just breaking what that looks like or how we use that data to inform program design? Yeah, so actually this past summer uh, was probably one of the more interesting projects I went through of a team that I didn't have GPS data on, but I had to infer from their training loads uh, what their buildup should potentially look like. So. I'm going to see and hope this doesn't get too long-winded or complex to follow. But with my women's soccer team, obviously there's a ton of literature in soccer mm -hmm. and I had enough contacts that I felt comfortable being able to reach out and just kind of compare practice data uh, over the course of a week. Cause my, my whole thought process and obviously what we, we uh, talked about heavily at William and Mary 
was being able to reverse engineer the demands of sport. So given all the constraints of the pandemic, um, you know, given the desire to make sure that the soccer team, if they were going to come back, have four weeks to build up and get ready to play a season, how could we know with a high degree of certainty that what we had built them up to doing from a uh, training standpoint, when they're away from us and we don't have eyes on them, how can we know that what we built them up to is going to prepare them for what we could envision to be their worst case scenario uh, week within the season itself. So what I ended up doing, and this was um, kind of the, the brainchild of uh, going back and forth with Kira about how to, how to best do this. What I ended up doing is soccer in college plays two games a week. They play on Thursdays and they play on Sundays. So those became my 100% days, if you will, of demands. Cause obviously you can have a practice that supersedes a game because of the turnaround times and the, you know, the, the basic periodization principles that sport coaches understand that you can't just bomb them with practice load the day before a game or the day after. Um, but so what we did is we, we anchored the Thursday and the Sunday as worst case scenarios. And from there, we tied the, uh, the highest game average RPE that we saw for the season. And we doubled that up for the, each Thursday and Sunday. So we summated that. Then we looked at, because I didn't have, there's not a lot of research around practice GPS data. What we did is we took the, those normative game demands. We looked at what the peak days we saw for uh, a typical, uh, they were off Mondays. So a typical Tuesday practice, a typical Wednesday, uh, a typical Friday and a typical Saturday. We looked at what are the, the highest workloads we saw from an RPE standpoint on those days. And so if it like, let's go for easy math. Let's say the game was an average of a thousand arbitrary units from an RPE standpoint, the peak was a thousand units. So that's a thousand units on Thursday. Let's say that the highest, uh, RPE day we saw Tuesday was 500 units. So we would anchor that as 50%. What we then did from that is we took the um, game demands and we said, what's 50% of that? And um, mapped that out as being what they would hit for that Tuesday. Did a similar thing on Wednesday where I think it was like 33%. It was very similar uh, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, around a third of game demands on those days. Also knowing phenomenologically that they were not doing any, uh, they were not doing any practice scenarios where the girls were going to be opening up and potentially getting into high speed running velocities. So we also cut out from that the high speed uh, distance running because we knew they weren't going to get into that because they're two days out from the previous game, which literature supports that you see peak uh, fatigue biomarkers two days out from the game. And then they're also two days from the next game. So you, you have to account for that and recognize that they're probably just doing a lot of skill work and a lot more uh, small-sided um, close quarters type drill work. They're never really opening up and scrimmaging on those days. So we cut out the, the high speed distance. We just focus more on the on feet demands. So looking at the total distance demands and just getting an aggregate for the week of what can we expect the on feet demands to be for a worst case scenario. So we mapped all that, I think, at the end of it, I want to say it was around 38,000 yards of total on feet. And I forget what like the sprint distances were and stuff like that. So then it became a matter of figuring out, well, how do we get to 38,000 yards on feet two weeks out from when we would expect them to report, they can get ready to come back and start playing uh, when they're slated to arrive. How can we get there using safe progression principles? So referring to a lot of Tim Gabbett's work around you know, no more than 10 to 15% jumps each week and systematically get them to a point where they can tolerate what we envision to be a worst case scenario uh, from a very mechanical perspective of feet time. And so we, we did that through, obviously, um, you know, your sprints, your uh, tempo runs, we sprinkled in some glycolytic work. So they, they had inoculation to working at those intensities. Um, but then we also did it through again, one of the limitations of COVID over the summer was that you weren't supposed to be in groups. So at that time, a lot of what they were relegated to doing was individual skill work or very small group skill work. And so we, um, where we had to get really creative and look at, um, we borrowed data from the men's side because they had GPS on their like 
solo skill segments in practice where guys would just be working by themselves or working with another person and just looked at the distance per minute of that um, to assume that, you know, obviously intensities are going to vastly differ in the sport when you get into the, the fuller sides, but individual skill work is pretty consistent, I would feel, between men's and women's soccer as far as what you can do. So we just use that to get a proxy of like, you know, if they, if they do individual skill work for 60 minutes, what sort of on feet uh, mechanical load is that going to get them? And I want to say it was like, it's like two miles for 60 minutes is what we had. So we also use that to figure out where we can get the remainder of that yardage. Because 38,000 yards is a pretty sizable weekly workload. And they're not able to play games to get a lot of that, which would knock out a ton of that yardage easily. So we had to be very creative between like what I called walking top ups where they would just go out and walk for, for set amounts of time. And then also skill work to obviously account for the, you know, building their, their technique and their skill as much as they can, given the circumstances to get to that um, worst case scenario that we envisioned for them to, to need to be ready for coming back. So I, I hope all that, that made sense about how we were able to, to do that. But basically it came from, we looked at, you know, there's a ton of data around, uh, soccer so we can use that to kind of figure out what those game days are going to look like and then we can infer based on the RPE data that we have on them and you know their perceptions of the way that we practice and whatnot we can infer if their normal Tuesday is percent of a game at its worst we can make the inference total distance because of the, the direct relationships that are seen in, in literature around RPE and metrics like total distance total player load, um, accelerations per minute. I believe there, there's a few variables in that there's positive uh, relationships with that we can, with a high degree of confidence, say that reverse engineering it in that way, albeit pretty, um, you know, off the beaten path for, for doing it, what was better than going into it blindly and not even trying to make the attempt to figure out what we prepare for coming out of a, a pandemic, no less. So that's one of that um, we were able to actually use it to begin to inform uh, the way that we prepared the girls. And then the second piece to that was we used a lot of that data to put together uh, our climatization policy of how we we're going to practice. And so that's where um, this was a tremendous uh, piece of collaboration that we did at William & Mary was putting together a, an actual prescription for return to sport and for getting ready to play again we had um variations for like if we had four weeks to get ready what would the durations how many sessions would they be allowed what would the durations of those sessions be able to be what would the intensity be um based on a uh, a guideline we put together of like okay if your one out of ten rpe activity is like a walkthrough or static skills and a 10 is you know, a worst case scenario game, repeat sprints, stuff like that, classify your drills based upon a number of criteria um, and where they fit. So the coaches go through this exercise of classifying all the drills that they utilized from, you know, one to 10 based on our criteria for each kind of segment that we looked at. So we looked at speed, um, agility demands, technical tactical demands, work to rest ratios, uh, field space available. And we said if, if the drill um, has one feature that puts it in a higher uh, classification box, it goes in the higher uh, classification box. So like the, the example we always referred to was uh, routes on air in football, where a 40 yard dash, if you were to take an RPE on, sorry, not a 40 dash, but like a 40 yard fly route, if you were to take an RPE on that, it, the kid's not going to give it a nine or a 10 because it's not that perceptually difficult but the risk factor is incredibly high when you're coming off of a period where you don't know what the kids have done to that point for him to sprint 40 yards, full speed, attempting to trap football, potentially if the quarterback overthrows him, now he's a stretch and land on one leg with the hamstring in an incredibly stretched position. Um, so that was where we, we looked at it from an RPE standpoint, but also from a risk standpoint. And we put together the, this acclimatization policy that depending on what fell out with the pandemic, we were going to have plans for teams and, uh, a four-week ramp up, a five-week or a six-week ramp up. And then we also had plans if they weren't going to play that fall, how they would practice and how they would build themselves up to be ready for whatever was to come at the point we're at now, actually. So um, it, we put this 
piece together in like I think a week. And honestly, the the work we did putting it together what was some of the most collaborative and intellectual work I've been able to do as a practitioner. And it was incredibly cool to see how it came together. And again, funnel to it was we're going to make sure we do what's absolutely best by the student athletes, but we're going to have a very systematic way for ensuring that we can get there safely. And so those were, you know, in the last year, two of the biggest ways that we were able to take the data that we collected essentially on no budget and make it very actionable and pragmatic for our coaches to understand why it's essential that we, uh, you know, have a, a system about the way that we it's back in the sport and for the admin to understand why it was important that we undertake this as well. And I think like that, that's amazing. There's a lot of fantastic stuff. I've just got a page of kind of notes or scribbles in front of me. Um, and there's a few directions I'd like to go in, but I'm going to try and control myself and I'll pick your brain uh -huh. kind of off air about some of them. Um, but one thing I did pick up on there, which is a little bit of an issue sometimes uh, with coaches that I think you mentioned and correct me if I'm wrong, there's, you, you said you wanted the coaches to go through and give kind of a, an RP based on like drill intensity or what they thought the drill intensity would be. So how do you find that if a coach is given one RP or one drill as like a 10 and then maybe the, an athlete's given it as like a six, do you find that quite a lot? Or how did you kind of manage for that and build, build kind of error into that program? Yeah. So obviously that was the, I think that's one of the key dichotomies you'll find is, you know, what a coach perceives to be a 10 versus what an athlete perceives to be a 10 mm -hmm. are, are, can be pr two pretty different things. And I'll, I want to say in two years of collecting um, RPEs from my girls on their, their game loads, I think I had one 10 and it was a double overtime, like thrill of a game that she also hadn't, eaten much food throughout the day so she went like really really hypoglycemic and, and symptomatic and throwing up after the game but it took that level of like extreme for someone to give me a 10 so most tend mm -hmm. to sit around an eight or a nine um just an interesting aside but um one of the and it, it was by no means a foolproof system but how we we put it together was that we we gave coaches this exercise and we said, you know, go through and classify your drills. And we gave them the stipulation that if a drill has a feature that belongs in a higher category, the drill goes in that higher category. I think initially, one of the things I think we made doing that was putting, we thought it was useful to include the RPE, especially around some of the more metabolically demanding drills that a coach might put together. But I think a lot of coaches kind of anchored themselves to that RPE versus like what we put to the left most of it was like the risk. So very low risk, low, moderate, high, very high, maximal. Um, we tried to anchor on that as, you know, uh, peripheral risk, central risk, metabolic risk, what have you, uh, collision contact risk. We, we tried to anchor on that, but I feel because that didn't necessarily register well, the RPE was a simpler uh, criteria to anchor themselves on when they went through and classified their drills. So there was definitely a bit of a back and forth, which is what we ended up setting up was that the section, then we come back and we'll meet as a staff to discuss why you put certain drills. Well. And I think this also speaks to uh, how helpful it would have been to have been able to be at practices more regularly and have, a, have an understanding what some of the nomenclature of those drills are and what they, they look like phenomenologically to aid better in that process because I, I can very easily sit down and put it together for a football team but lacrosse was still a sport that I was learning and then soccer there there's a lot of different drill scenarios that you can go through um and it was enough though I had experience playing it growing up I didn't play it at a level where you saw a lot of the, those drills that I could very easily pick out on a sheet and say I know what that is yes as long as I know that doesn't um so it, was, it definitely speaks to the, the limitation of what we were able to do um, because we didn't have enough human resources to be at practice all the time and have a better understanding of what it is that the coaches are looking at and why they may have put a drill in a particular category. Uh, and of course it was difficult to work through on zoom when, you know, you're just staring at a screen and you can't like sit down and, and diagram it or readily 
um, you know, go through it on the field and like play it out with the coaching staff because nobody was on campus or allowed to be on campus. So it, it was a very, it was a tough undertaking, but I think it was, it, it did open up good conversations around what the sport coaches perceive the demands of their drills to be. And, you know, does a drill fit if, you know, your day before a game, does it make sense to be doing this drill versus doing it two days out, depending on, you know, what it is that you're chasing. So I think it, it did open up some good conversations, but there's obviously always going to be a bit of a misalignment with what the, the sport coach perceives and what the athletes perceive and what the performance coach perceives. Uh, and that's where I think, again, when you, when you come back and one of the things I would have loved to have gotten to would have been uh, sport coaches giving what they thought the RPE of the practice would be for the day. And then to see how that aligns with what the athletes actually give to infer if a good kind of grasp on where their kids are at and that the practice they put together is representative of what they perceive that intensity of the day to be. Um, or if they're, they're way off and need to be calibrated a little bit to what's actually manifesting on the field and how you can put together a practice that, that better reflects the target intensity for the day. Um, mm -hmm. so that's somewhere I would have loved to have gone to begin to create that alignment. And that was actually one of the pieces that I think I, yeah, I did do it in the uh, second webinar I did for, for Strength Coach Network was effectively like a, a trim planner where you could sit down and map out okay, uh, this first practice back is going to be a six RPE for 60 minutes. Second day back is going to be a four for 90 minutes and go on, so on and so forth. And then once you started plugging in actual data, you could see a graph of how the day that as it was planned matches up to the day as it actually occurred with the data. So that was one of the pieces that was going to be very central to what we did getting the kids back into sport at William and Mary was, yeah, you've got to sit down and you've got to fill out this strength planner. And then as things are happening, see what, if you overshoot and the day is way harder than you anticipated, that means you've got to back off somewhere else. So it was, I think it was going to be a very helpful tool for us to, again, align everybody's view of reality and get an understanding for some of the factors that you may not consider in what makes a practice hard or what makes, you know, a certain drill uh, harder or easier. Uh, I think it was going to help us to, to centralize much better and to begin to have the, those conversations that lend themselves uh, to getting more alignment so that things are much more aligned with that high performance model. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, that's great as well. And there's again, like a lot of fantastic things that I think people can take from that. Uh, and just number one, getting coaches and, and athletes kind of on the same page uh, and coaches and coaches, sports performance coaches and sports coaches are on the same page as well. So everyone kind of knows and understands actually what's happening. Um, one other thing I actually want to come back to just before I move on to my, to my final question is you mentioned in that build up to kind of return to sport coming off the back of COVID, even though we're still in the middle of COVID, um, that kind of collaborative effort you said was the best you've ever seen. And you kind of brought all of this um, information together and this plan together in the space of a week just a lot of coaches maybe don't fully understand or there's a lot of communication issues in high performance sport. Do you mind just explaining kind of what that collaborative effort looked like within your high performance model? Because I think sometimes people can get a little bit lost within what does an interdisciplinary team look like? How do we actually communicate? So do you mind just kind of divulging on a few of those kind of details? Yeah. Um, I think one of the pieces that was a feature of my time at William & Mary was the autonomy that I had. And for it being my first full-time job and for me to work with the level of coaches that I was working with, uh, with Eric and Kier, they were incredibly hands-off and willing to let me do my thing and, and, and fail and learn from it. And they were always in my corner to help me to understand why I failed or what a better approach may have been, but they were going to allow me that freedom and that autonomy to do as I saw fit for uh, the programs that I worked with. And you know, one of the things I, I've always appreciated about Eric and Kier is how objective they are and how they are so fundamentally in pursuit of the truth, not just 
anchored on what they are emotionally drawn to. And so they, they were very candid and open conversations throughout my time there. You know, there, there was a lot of a lot of the, so if you've read Ray Dalio's principles, um, a lot of what he talks about in that book as being essential for uh, high performing organizations are, are traits that Eric and Keir genuinely embodied. And, you know, there was a willingness to, to be upfront and honest about what it was that we're, we were doing. We were given very distinct directions that we were tasked to go with, but how we got there was not going to be uh, determined by, um, you know, Eric wasn't telling us you must Olympic lift. You must, you know, pick your, your, your point on any other, you know, I guess ideology that comes off as more of a, a cult, if you will. Um, we were allowed to do whatever got us the results that we were going to get. And so when I, I, you know, alluded to the, the work we did with that acclimatization piece, the initial draft of that, that, practice uh, classification guidelines was the brainchild of myself and Ray Eady, who's still the director of basketball performance there. We sent it in our group chat and then Eric loved the idea, wanted to refine it a little bit, Kier added his ideas to it, sent it back into the group and we, we kept kind of refining it and honing it. And it was like, even down to the level of where I mentioned, like initially we were anchored on RPE. I want to say it was I think it was Kier actually who thought organizationally we should put risk as the, the leading column so that rather than just associating the RPE uh, with how they classify the drills, they'll see it more as risk. So like the example of the, the fly route with football, it's high risk. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, throughout that whole process, there was never a, <clears throat> there was never a moment where like, Kier or Eric just pulled rank and did it their way. It, it was this entirety of everybody working together to put this piece together and figure out how we could map it all out. And so then even when they put together the structure for uh, four or five or six week uh, practice ramp ups, they were sending it out and the, the line they always left it on was what holes do you see in this? Like, you know, poke holes in it as much as you can and send it back with, with your feedback. and. So even from high level guys who have been in sport, I think Eric's been in sport nearly two decades at this point. Kier's obviously been in it about 10 to 15 years, I think. I lose track of how old he is at this point. But um, <laughs> like these guys who have done it at the highest, highest levels are still asking for feedback from myself, who still my first full-time position and Alex, who had just gotten there in January. So he had, he had a rough go of it getting there in January and all of a sudden being shut down uh, with the <laughs> pandemic. But they're willing to seek feedback from us and, and make us feel invested in the process. And I, I think that gets at a lot of what you see around group dynamics is that even when people don't necessarily get their way, if they, they feel like they've had their chance to speak their piece and, and stand for their position, and at the end of the day, you end up going in a different direction, people are much more willing to align with the direction you're going in and push it forward as being the way for the group rather than stand off to the side and complain about how their ideas aren't accepted and nobody believes in what they're talking about or what have you. And so I just, for, for me, the, how quickly we got such a, a massive project done because part of that was that we did an audit of every single sport that we had in our um in our athletic department and so we did a sport by sport breakdown uh invoking adherence rates within team builder because that was one of the pieces we invested in uh to make our lives a little bit easier over the pandemic was team builder you can go in and see uh what percentage of workouts athletes have completed mm -hmm. in there so we we pulled that for every single sport we gave some statistical information about averages uh medians um number of kids that had 0% utilization rate. And then we mapped out essentially from previous training data that we had, what was the highest week of um, workload that they were exposed to, how long using a 15% jump from what a team is expected to be at right now based on how uh, closely they're adhering to team builder, how long would it take for them to get to that worst case scenario week? 
you know, more than 15% per week. And I think that put it into a very, um, you know, staunch reality for a lot of coaches that they think they've got these kids that are doing everything they're told. And then they find out that only 35% of the kids have done the workouts that are in team builder. And so it's just kind of, it was a good gut check. And then we, we included some information around the, uh, the NFL lockout in 2011, uh, the Bundesliga injury um, data from when they restarted back in May. We included that, included um, a couple other pieces, but it was a full page report for every single sport. So we had 23 uh, sports laid out. We had the practice planning guidelines. We had the drill class guidelines. We had basically a, a synopsis of those more qualitative in nature of the physical and psychological ramifications of the pandemic and of trying to ramp up into sport too quickly. So we just, we painted this very holistic picture of what the fundamental issue is and the problem, the solution we were going to provide for ensuring that we avoided these um, potential issues. And it ended up being like a 50 page document. And again, it's, to me, what embodied the high performance aspect of it was the fact that we were able to put together such a high quality, highly informed, objectively driven document and not just say there's a problem, but provide every um, permutation of a solution that we could need to provide based upon whatever was going to happen this fall. And so uh, I think the, you know, the, the tenants that made us as good as we are or as good as we were in that moment were that everybody was fundamentally aligned to what the goal was and you know so we all had the same north star we had different ways of how we thought to get there and it was always about the best idea winning it was not about well eric said it so that means it's the idea or kier said it and he's way smarter than everybody else in the world so we're gonna go with it it was a back a genuine back and forth and it was this openness to other people's ideas, no matter on rank, but obviously giving weight to the ideas and sessions of people who have been doing it longer. So that was where, yeah, they made us equals in the discussion, but given their experiences and not just, you know, how long they've been doing it, but the miles they've done it at and the repeated successes they've had multiple places that kind of gave it that, that believability weighted factor of, you know, they've seen a lot more, they've done a lot more their answer probably has a lot more backing it than my answer being, you know, five years into college training conditioning or whatever it is at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was that feeling of, of oneness towards the goal and that allowance of us to be invested in the process with them that I think made it go. And it, it always goes back to me, for me to the experience I had with my lacrosse team. Um, we were all making it up as we went with, the high performance undertaking that we had with that lacrosse team in my first year. I had read some stuff around tactical periodization, but I think the scope of it was like stuff James Smith had put out on like elite FTS back in the early 2010s. And, but it was nowhere near to the level that I was eventually doing with it um, in their end season of lacrosse my, after that, the end of that first year, I guess. But what made it, go and what made us right was that you know we would be in the meeting room for an hour on Mondays and I think a a good kind of a heuristic for if if your your culture's on the right track is if you you enjoy being in in meetings with each other because it was you know a part catching up but then it was also we were just we enjoyed the process of collaborating to figure out where's the team at where do we need to go this week how do we need to get there and what does everybody need and how can we take what everybody needs and put it together to create a plan that is what's best for the girls and to have genuinely had that culture around the way that we operated and i'm sure there were times we messed up i'm sure of it 100 percent. but because we left the room and the answer that they would get from the head coach was the answer to get from the strength coach was the answer they get in the at and the girls couldn't try to, you know, game one of us against the other, like they would, they had done in years past that ultimately allowed us to go further um, than we would have gone if it was typical group culture where I get my way and the assistant coach is mad. And then our 
dynamic isn't great. And then she says an offhand remark to a player that erodes at the foundation of what they're doing with me. Um, that ends up taking away from what they end up getting out of the work they're doing with me. So uh, that, that fundamental alignment and then that, that willingness to drop the ego and figure out how you can take what everybody wants and first make sure that it's, you know, it's, it's valid to what they're, they're seeking. So like coaches that want athletes who play fast, but then they want to just do a bunch of medium intensity conditioning. It's like, okay, if you want to play fast, we need to do things that allow them to actually express high rates of play. Um, and here into that is you need to rest more. So pieces like that, where you, you kind of, you sift through what it is that they're after and you, you arrive at, you know, objectively, is this the, the most pragmatic way to get what it is you're wanting to get out of practice or out of training? Um, and if there's, you know, a, uh, application like I remember one of the days we we needed to hit a speed top up that day but we were also trying to taper them for practice uh because they were getting ready to play their first game so me needing my speed top up coaches wanting more practice time what we came to was a drill where the girls would um they would uh cradle through traffic work on keeping the ball tight make sure that they don't get stick and lose the ball and then they would open up and sprint 30 yards and they were told you know they were given the coaching for the technical piece and then they were told, as soon as you get out of it, sprint as fast as you can. And so that was how we, we got the speed top up. And mm -hmm. again, that's, you know, good ideas of a speed top up and of getting more practice work, merging together to become a great idea that's more efficient for the athletes and respect the fact that we needed to taper to make sure they could freshen up play. So uh, I think everything that I just alluded to with the, the collaboration piece and, and what makes high performance teams go. It, it's not the, the data. It's not the GPS. It's not the, the dashboards. It, it's people that are, are open and honest with each other and willing to collaborate and be egoless in the process and willing to communicate and be transparent. It's a lot of what Ray Dalio talks about in his book, Principles, that if you're able to hit on the, those major bedrocks, I, I think a lot of it solves itself and you, you get the emergent outcomes that you want. And ultimately, it's those pieces that to me allowed the girls to say this was the best year of my life or the best season of my life mm -hmm. and I think that's a that's a great point to actually to finish on there as well I think we'll I have got a few more questions but I'm hoping that you'll come back for a part two at some point because I think there's actually quite a few more layers we can we can get into there um, but just before we finish I'd like to finish with some quick fire questions if that's okay so let's do it very very quickly so that there's not many we've got four questions or well two questions really um first question is three books that you'd recommend to anyone go principles by red dalio mm -hmm. um almanac and ball Robicon, and I'm trying not to give into my recency bias of what i've just been reading uh, <laughs> soon enough i'm gonna give into it and say team of teams because it's encapsulating a lot of the thoughts that I, I've had around how groups work and how mm. groups need to work. Yeah. Um, so those would be my three. Solid. I like it. The one piece of advice for the young strength coach just getting into the profession. <laughs> Go in eyes wide open. No one way is the absolute right way. You're just figuring out how to be less wrong over time. So take a little bit from every experience you have, take a little bit from coaches you may not necessarily agree with because they may end up being the coaches that in 10 years, you're like, you know what? I think he was onto something. So um, yeah, keep your eyes wide open and aim to be less wrong. And then nearly there, what does, uh, what does Scott like to do in his spare time? I'm sorry? What does Scott like to do in his spare time away from strength and conditioning? Uh, I picked up a guitar about almost two years ago and that's been a lot of fun. And then, uh, I guess the, the professional skill that I've come to enjoy actually has been coding. So, um, I, I like the algorithmic nature of it and figuring out how to be more efficient with large streams of data. But I, I like, to me, it's just also, it's one of those cool skills that everybody's saying is going to be like, it's obviously here, but it's going to become that much more 
important in the future. So I, I do enjoy both of those very much, but purely away from strength and conditioning, guitar for sure. Nice. No, I like it. I wish I could play the guitar. <laughs> and then just, just <laughs> Let finally, me tell you. It's, go on. No, I was just saying it was, it's been quite a process to learn, but it's reinforced a lot of like good tenants to have around preparation of like even just getting 20 minutes a day of practice at it and being consistent with it it is far more than if you do one hour long session once a week Mm -hmm. so it's it's been great from that standpoint but then it's also just a good release to like completely remove myself from anything training related that's uh, that's maybe where i need to start man there you go and then just finally (laughs) where can uh, where can people find you if they if they've got any messages or questions yeah, so my social media is Scott Kuhn 88 So Kuhn is K-U-E-H-N. I'm pretty active on there. So, and uh, that's usually where I'm best to. If you have short questions, um, for sure, uh, social media platforms are great. If you, if you want to get more extended questions or anything like that, uh, I believe my email set up on my Instagram to where they can just hit the button and it'll reach out to me to, to email. And if you're, you're interested in the webinars, I will plug that. I'll send you a link for uh, 50% off the first month at Strength Coach Network. Fully believe in what they're doing there and um, what that is for young coaches. I, I would, it's a shameless plug, but for young coaches, I think to get a great starting point of education just because there, there's so much out there and with the prevalence of the internet it can be very tough to filter between the you know guru footwork guy that is just doing what's cool for the gram and very qualified high level practitioners that have done it with in the setting that you're looking to work in uh, i think it's a very strongly and well curated feed of presentations on topics that that span everything you can need to do in sport so um would fully recommend that kind of off the heels of the the question you asked there mm-hmm. perfect if there's uh, there's kia's plug again he's he's living up the road <laughs> <laughs> can you tell i spent a little bit of time around in the last few years there you go eh? <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, look, thank you very much for coming on today. This has been phenomenal. I've got pages and pages of information. Um, if anyone knows or wants to reach out to you, they know where to go. And then hopefully we can get you back on at some point for a, for a part two and we'll get into, into the weeds a little bit more. So thank you very much and I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you.